Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, good morning and welcome, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll indeed share with you some of the experiences uh, that we have in Accelerator in, in writing codes, parallel codes for matrix solvers. I have just three aut authors here listed, um, and I'm probably the one who did the least of the work here. I'd like to acknowledge some other people who worked with us, Steve Thomas and uh, Dan Sisa in particular, and James Perry. Um, so uh, we started working uh, on those things in, uh, in 2000s, early 2000s, uh, with a couple of projects. Uh, uh, we first tried to do things on FPGAs uh, and then uh, realized what's the available potential power of GPUs uh, and formally started the company in 2004. And here's an interesting twist to the story. In 2004, when we finally got our first product and we're talking to people in the industry and we're trying to tell them, look, we have this potential acceleration of your products, but we're using gamers card to do this, they would show us the door immediately. So, you know, in those few years for, since 2004, the world changed. And everybody now knows about uh, GPUs. This is ubiquitous technology. Everybody expects to use one and expects that that will lead to acceleration to so a very, very high degree. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, linear systems. Uh, most of you, I imagine, know uh, about this, but just to be, uh, just to be fair, uh, let's say that linear systems are prevalent uh, in, in technology, and not only technology, in many aspects of our life. Um, problems like computational fluid dynamics, thermal analysis, uh, mechanical simulations, electromagnetic simulations, where I come from a lot, computational science, finances, biology, all or many of problems in this, these areas can be, in the end, formulated as linear systems. Um, those uh, linear problems can, in the end, uh, express themselves in a number of different uh, matrix forms. And there's a, a lot of different ways to actually divide those different and categorize those. Um, for the purpose of what we are doing here, we'll first divide them in dense uh, linear systems and sparse linear systems. And as an example, in electromagnetics, where I come from, a uh, method of moments would typically lead to dense linear system, while, while finite elements method will uh, usually lead to, to very, very sparse systems. Um, of course, sparse and dense systems numerically have very, very different properties, and then will require quite different methods to actually solve them. Dense problems uh, uh, are quite well suited to massive parallel machines like GPU. Um, there is, there is uh, many, really all, all, all that you really need is many processing uni units and high memory bandwidth, which is exactly what GPU provides. And uh, at this point, there's a number of, of available uh, tools in the literature. Kula mentioned earlier today is one excellent example. Mag Magma is another excellent example. And I expect that there's going to be a growing number of those publicly available and, and commercially available as this is where the world is going. Uh, contrary to dense matrices, uh, sparse problems are quite a bit more difficult to, to solve uh, using massively powered machines. Um, data patterns uh, vary from one problem to the other quite, quite a bit. There is no consistency in, in different problems in different fields. Um, so that's one of the big challenges. Um, people use a variety of different storage formats. That's another challenge. And uh, basically, those factors and, and variety of problems that, that you want to leave and types of matrices make this somewhat difficult. Um, Again, classifying those things a bit more, we can, we can uh, subdivide types of solvers used uh, for linear systems into direct solvers and into iterative solvers. Direct solver, an example, would be multifrontal, for example, uh, whereas iterative uh, solver itself would be some type of Krylov space method uh, like GMRS, QMR, and this sort of thing. And typically, those are not just good enough on their own. You need to combine those with some pretty complicated preconditioners. So um, how do you choose which one to, to use? Um, there is a number of different uh, factors that would decide which one you use. And some of them are pretty quantitative. Like you know, if you have a lot of uh, large number of non-zeros and large problems, you will probably navigate or, or gravitate towards iterative solvers. On the other hand, when you have a lot of right-hand sides, you might want to use direct solver. Uh, 
if your if your system is, is really poorly conditioned and that's typically the case well then you really have to think which one of them to use and there's no real recipe which one to choose and beyond sort of uh, mathematical reasoning there's also psychology uh, in many industries, people just like using one particular solver, and even though it doesn't necessarily make sense, they still use it. Uh, and finally, in cases that fall between, for example, when you have five, five right-hand sides, again, it's not easy to decide which type of solvers is going to be better for you. So it's, it's not clear how to actually exactly select those. So uh, we play in both fields. Uh, we were working on uh, multi-frontal solvers. And here, our main goal was to accelerate some of the commercial multi-frontal solvers in our, with our partners. Um, we focused on just the very, very bottom of the solver, which really uh, renders itself very well to GPU, and that's LDLT method. And what I wanted to share with you is that uh, for uh, if, you, if you run, if you program LDLT method for, uh, for uh, direct solvers. Uh, if you do it in single precision in particular, which is, which is what we really had available so far in GPUs, and if you compare it to a relatively good uh, Dell system uh, with two uh, processors in it uh, and lots of memory, well, you, you end up with a system uh, that in single precision can get up to 300 gigaflops um, for relatively large uh, matrix size. Uh, and you can see that this curve is fairly flat. However, you can also see that when your fronts or your matrices that you want to LDLT are fairly small, then uh, the system, the performance is not that great. So the answer to this is that uh, multifrontal solver, in order for us to actually achieve very, very high speed, needs to be capable of issuing multiple fronts at the same time. And not all uh, existing commercial multifront solver can do that. But if they can, then we can really see a significant acceleration. Double precision was lagging behind, but of course the announcement of uh, new hardware from NVIDIA is going to address this problem very effectively. So if you now look at uh, sort of uh, entire solver and the performance of the entire solver, again, there's difference between single precision and double precision, as you would expect. But you can see that for a large number of uh, degrees of freedom that fall sort of in this area, um, you can count on a last generation of uh, NVIDIA hardware, so a year old 1060 sort of hardware, to still provide overall acceleration of the factor of four for the solver, which is, which is not too bad. So now if we go into iterative solvers, uh, um, you know, the, the, you really have to focus on two things. You have to focus on the solver itself, and that's uh, typically methods like GMRS, uh, conjugate gradients, uh, or QMR, TFQMR. And then, uh, really, you quickly realize that in order to implement those things, what you really need to do is to, uh, is to formulate this problem and utilize a very efficient matrix vector uh, multiplier. So that's how you want to reduce all those problems, express them in, in terms of matrix vector multiplier. Uh, but you also, you also realize very quickly that just about all practical problems will not converge on their own, and you need to utilize most of the time, or almost always, uh, a very sophisticated preconditioner. Um, sparse matrix and vector multiply uh, is actually another operation, even in sparse uh, world, that uh, expresses itself very well on GPU. It's an uh, uh, operation that uh, is relatively easy to program, and you can uh, get this thing to, to be very, very fast. Our uh, accelerator implementation of uh, sparse vector, vector multiplier is about two times faster in single precision than whatever we could find in, in open public, public domain and, and somewhat faster, 25% faster in double precision. But it quickly turns out that it's not what really is the key to achieving the solution. Uh, GMRS is fast. What is not fast and what starts to dominate the problem is actually preconditioner. So let's talk a little bit about those. And uh, this graph is a good example. It's a problem that comes from low frequency electromagnetics. It's about one million unknowns in this problem. And you can see how different properties, uh, different preconditioners uh, would actually have. And this problem would not converge at all uh, with, without any preconditioner or with something simple like Jacobi. 
So if we take uh, a known preconditioner like ILU1, that's the blue curve on the right, and if we set 10 to 